Hi, I'm Scott Reed. I am the writer, artist, and publisher of Hark. It is a six-issue miniseries. First issue is out right now. You can go to uh, beyondforwardcomics.com. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator. He has been in the industry for a very long time, and he has made some of one of my favorite comics of all time with, with Hulk, as well as Jai Joe, as well as tons of others that I'll let him explain. But we're talking to the ever-talented uh, creator of Hark. Scott Reed, how are you doing today, Scott? I'm doing good. This is uh, this is exciting because I've I've finally got back in touch with your style of of comic creation, which is awesome to see. I love the fact that you're creating a brand new series with Hark. But for those that don't know anything about this particular series, tell us what it's all about. Hark is a first. It's a six issue mini series that I'm writing and drawing and publishing. It's basically about a. Uh, it's about an android on this planet called Serad, who is this, he's like a pacifist, right? And he convinces the entire uh, civilization to throw down their weapons, to live in peace. Um, and so they do. And so almost overnight, they become this utopia. Hark's work is done. And so he kind of goes into sleep mode and wakes up a hundred years later to find that an alien... Uh, race invaded their planet and basically wiped out, nearly wiped out the entire civilization. He learns that they didn't resist, they didn't fight, they didn't do anything because they were following his teachings. And so Hark is suddenly faced with this dilemma of what does he do? You know, does he does he go against his own teachings and 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 seek revenge? You know, and turn to violence. Or does he continue along the path that he was on? And so that's kind of part of the story, and then it just kind of unfolds from there. First off, the the art and the writing just blew me out of the water. Like the first couple of pages, just looking at the preview was just like, wow, this looks like it's an epic fantasy uh, novel or sci-fi superhero-ish novel. I, I don't know what, you, what genre you'd like to call this, but it's Holy a great God. novel. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have an amazing world you have some interesting starting characters i love this concept but what did you draw from to create these particular characters well i think part of it was i was drawing on you know kind of what's happening to our world you know there's a lot of violence in our world there's wars and you know we're kind of ruining the environment and you know we just don't really have our our act together and so I was kind of, it's in a, it's sort of an analogy of, of some of the, the crisis that we're facing, you know, as a species. And so I kind of wanted to, to sort of speak to that on one level, not to be like heavy handed on it, because ultimately this is a, it's a science fiction action adventure story, you know, and it's got, I think, some pretty, uh, pretty cool twists along the way. And then there's some big reveals um, that I, that I just don't want to talk about because then it's then then what's the point of reading it but um so yeah that's kind of what i was drawing on was was that and and you know kind of kind of thinking along the lines of like buddhist philosophy and something which has interested me you know in the last few years um i wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit and just examine uh, you know uh, us as a species and a culture and, and what we're doing wrong and what we could do right um so there's some heavy stuff there but like i said it's I, all the books that I write, I try to kind of put that under, sort of under the rug, under the surface. You know, my main goal is to really entertain. It's amazing what you can draw from from philosophy to not only write stories, but to to create life in a brand new world, especially with with this particular series. Yeah, yeah, I, I love I love world building. I mean, that's something that you know it's kind of been my curse because I I can't write little stories. I want to you know. I want to write a little story, like a little like 22 page comic. And then I can't, it's like, I, I, there's, it, it just turns into this Pandora's box and then I start expanding it and expanding it. And then it turns into this kind of huge thing. That's always, you know, it's, it's 
it's tough. It's hard. It's hard to, to do those kinds of stories, but I enjoy it. But that's that's kind of the hallmark of your career, though. You've created a lot of great mini series that people have enjoyed throughout their their lives and that have inspired them to be creative in their own way. What is it about the mini series that that just makes it so appealing to your style of of writing? I guess I can just look at like the book I did before Hark was Saga of a Doomed Universe, which was also this kind of gigantic project and it was it was really a um a love letter to the 80s comics you know i'd really tried to to just throw myself right into that style you know that 80s bronze age stuff which i'm naturally just that's the kind of style that i tend to to gravitate towards myself um and so with hark yeah i don't know if i don't know if i have a, a an answer to that i just had a story that had to be told and i and i felt like you know, I wrote it as a manuscript in 2017, and then I decided I was going to adapt it to a comic. And, and you know, I played around with the idea of getting other artists involved. Um, but at the end of the day, I was like, you know, I'm kind of going to have to do, I think I'm going to have to do this myself. And so, you know, for better, for better or for worse, you know, I'm, I'm applying my skills and, and, and what I can do and what I can bring to the table to it. You know, as a creator that you are, since you, you write and you do art as well, so you, you're like the, the trifecta of uh, being a creative person. I, I can't do art. I, I just write. That's just, that's just how I do things. <laughs> but what was the first thing that you created that made you realize I could do this as a career? I mean, I guess in high school, you know, I was really into comics, you know, probably in junior high, I started to really get into into that. And it's one of those things where when you're a kid, you don't realize there are people making comics, you know, it's on some level when you're really young. And then I think when I, when I started to put two and two together, you know, when I was maybe 13 or 14 and realized, Hey, there's people, but they make these, you know, and, and I like to draw and maybe I can do this, you know? So that's kind of, <clears throat> I think that's kind of where it started for me. Obviously, language and uh, looking at philosophy, that's the epitome of, of language, trying to understand the human condition, or at least oneself for that matter. Uh, when did you experience that language had power? First experience, I should say. say. Oh, definitely, probably not in comics. It was probably, um, you know, again, probably the earliest books that I read, um, you know, H.G. Wells stuff, you know, when I was a kid, and then Tolkien and then Stephen King I think maybe Stephen King just his use of of the vocabulary you know and just being visceral I think with some of his word choices I think really taught me you know like oh okay this is words have real really real impact you know if you choose them wisely in in, in uh, literature so I think that and then and then probably with comics reading Frank Miller I think in the 80s you know he had a very kind of scaled back approach to writing, you know, dialogue. Um, and I, and, and I kind of felt like, okay, there's, there's power here in this medium, you know, and, and I, I would like to write like that. You've been in the industry a long time and Too long. for those that are looking, <laughs> but, uh -huh. but you've enjoyed it or also I don't think you'd keep doing it. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Um, what is the most misunderstood aspect about this particular industry of comics? Oh, geez. There are several, I, you know, there's that there's a lot of money in it. <laughs> and it's like, where, where, when are we going to start making a lot of money in comics? Because now, you know, comics are, are part of pop culture. You know, we've got, um, you know, they've kind of finally become their own genre in film and TV. And so it's become this mainstream thing. Um, and I, I think maybe it's starting to trickle down a little bit into the, the comics industry. On, on one or two levels, um, but it's definitely a tough, it's a very tough field to, to work in over a long period of time, you know, without having to kind of segue into pivot, you know, into other professions. Uh, and I've, I've definitely done that myself. You know, I've worked in comics. I can say I've worked in comics for a long time, but I've also worked outside of comics for a long time. And I think that's kind of the new norm for, creators young and and not so young um that you just kind of have to 
you know, you kind of have to be able to pivot quickly because the work is not always, it's not always going to be there. What have you done outside the industry that, uh, well, that you can talk about? Uh, I'm a graphic designer. And so I've been, I've worked as a graphic designer for as long as I've worked in comics. I've, it's always been kind of a hand in hand thing for me, um, working in, in uh, print and in digital, you know, doing uh, graphic work and, and web design work. Um, it's something I'm also like really super passionate about. It's, it's definitely um, a career that I love. And the great thing about it is I've been able to kind of incorporate those skill sets into my comic work over the years, being able to kind of like, you know, marketing, do, doing my own uh, marketing work. You know, I, I have those that that's kind of in my wheelhouse, too. Over the decades, we've gone from an analog process to a digital process. How long did it take you to switch from analog to, to digital for your, your work? Uh, it was kind of gradual, I think. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to, to remember, like, hand lettering comics. And when I worked at Malibu Comics, um, I was uh, a, an anchor in the art department there. And, of course, the letterers there were... They were, you know, hand lettering it and, and getting the exacto out and cutting out the word balloons and pasting, pasting them down on the art. And I learned that process, you know, so I did, I made my comics in that way. And of course, drawing everything by hand, probably, probably up until, I want to say, you know, maybe 2003 or 2004, I think then I started to dapple with, um, uh, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and, and starting to do um, some of the work digitally. And then, uh, you know, I, I think I, I bought my first Wacom tablet in 2009. And so I was kind of, I went full force into digital at that point, you know, drawing everything on the tablet and inking, inking digitally. I'd already been coloring digitally for a number of years, but but then at that point, it kind of all became digital for a while for me. Um, now I, I kind of have a happy medium because I still love, I still love the analog, you know, process too. I think that something gets, I think things get lost, you know, when it, when it goes totally digital. And so I try to, like I pencil, I pencil everything digitally just because I don't like mucking with erasers anymore and, and dealing with all that mess so I, I pencil everything digital and then i will i will convert it to and it's just, this is getting like really like in the weeds of my process that's, but that's okay i i uh i convert the lines to, to blue line and then i print those out i have a wide format printer and so then i print the digital pencils out and i take it over to my drafting board which is over there and then i ink it by hand so i, I try i'm trying to like integrate some of the analog process back into the digital process. Uh, you know, I was always curious about this though. I've talked to a lot of graphic designers as well as illustrators, as well as comic artists uh, over the years. Some people like blue pencil, some people like red pencil. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no, it's just to me, that would be weird to, to like ink red lines, but that's just me. And that's just because of, that's from my my generation or whatever of of you know artists who understand that back in the day it not it was called non photo blue pencils where you could literally draw on a piece of paper and you could photocopy it and that blue will not show up and so it's I think and now it's more of like a tradition that you would you know convert your lines to blue because of that but I think there's a I think there's a red also that won't photograph so maybe that's why maybe that's why people i've never done i've never tried the red now now i'll have to try that well i i, mean, I, was, <laughs> I was always curious because it's like some people swear by red some people swear by blue i'm just that's like, interesting hey, man, you, you, everyone's doing amazing work as it is so uh, i don't think it matters what <laughs> that just seems really weird to me but but yeah. you know if it works cool this is a, a six issue series, so you have a lot uh, that's going on in this series, and I can't wait to see more about it. Editing this book obviously must have taken a bit of time as well, too. 
What did you edit out of the book that you wished you could have kept in, at least maybe for oh, the first issue? You know, that's a good question. I had, I've never really thought about that. I, I, write, I wrote the manuscript, and then when I wrote the script, the comic script, I chop, I had to chop out a lot of things. And it's it's interesting when you put on that editor hat, you find scenes that you may have, you may have written, or at least in my case, where I've – it's sort of like it's communicating the same information twice, or you have a scene that – Oh, well, this was really kind of summarized in an earlier scene. We don't really need to, to revisit that. You know, it's kind of redundant. And you don't always realize that when you're writing, it. you know, when you just, you're letting this thing flow and you write it out. It's only when you go back, you start to see that there are moments, even like dialogue, you know, why, why mention this? Why have him say whatever, you know, when he's, it's clear that he's doing this thing, or it's clear that he already did this thing, why, why bring it back, you know, so there, so when I edit it, there's a lot of stuff that, that gets chopped out, and then, and then there's another stage to, to my editing, because since I'm the writer and the artist, I will write, I'll write a full script, and then once I start drawing it and lettering it, then I start doing kind of another level of, of editing, or then I can start to kind of refine the dialogue and sort of boil it down a little further because you kind of need to do that for comics. You know, I mean, Chris Claremont got away with it for years of just, you know, pages. And I'm reading some of his, it's funny, I'm reading some of his old X-Men stuff right now. And uh, so there's, it's like a novel, you know, each issue, there's, it's so dense. And he kind of was able to, to, to pull that off, you know, but, but for me, I try to I try to sort of boil things down a little bit. So there's a couple of, I guess to answer your question, there's a couple of levels of of editing for me. Um, and the last one is when I'm actually lettering the comic, then I then I have the freedom to go in and make decisions right at the eleventh hour. Yeah, this is something I've heard recently, and I don't don't know if it, especially when it comes to uh, editing your script itself before you actually put it to page. Um, have you ever done a word search and searched for the letters L Y? L Y. No. Is this like an Illuminati thing? You're about to tell. I call it a video editing process that I've <laughs> okay. done throughout the years as well, too. But it, it it works for film scripts as well. If you search for the word L Y, it's more of a passive approach to actions. So if you search through your your manuscript before you actually put it to page, and you find that you have like. 365 L quote unquote L Y's in your script, you might have to go through those again and, and tighten up your action a bit. Interesting. Did not know that. I wonder why. I mean, what does that mean? What is that, you know? Because as you said, you're so focused in on your script that you don't really notice things until you actually actively re-edit or yeah. go through it again. So if you take the time to let your computer do the work for you to find these sections where why did I say they, you know, they were slowly walking towards this or they were, oh. um, et cetera. So rather than saying they stalked or whatever. So, huh. you, okay. I'll definitely try that. That and the red lines. This has been, <laughs> after this interview, I'm, I mean, everything changes for me. That's, that's the most praise I've, I've ever <laughs> received. So I, I, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're both learning something. So yeah, yeah, it works out well. Right. <laughs> this industry obviously is is tough from a uh, mental perspective as well as from long hours. You know, you have to really keep yourself not only physically fit but but mentally sharp as well too. How do you take time to take care of yourself? Um, well, I didn't for a long time, uh, and you know, when I was younger, because when you're young, when you're young, you don't worry about those things. You can sit for 16 hours and you know stay up all night and 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 work and and i think as i've gotten older i've i've uh started to i think uh uh manage that a little better you know i don't pull all-nighters anymore and I, I just have a very i do have a pretty structured work schedule you know i have the time allotted to when i'll, I'll work on a comic a comic project um so yeah, I mean, health is your health is all you've got, you know. So you've got to take you. You definitely need to take care of it. I, I a few years ago, I got a, um, uh, a an adjustable standing desk, 
or you can you can lower it and raise it. And so um, that's been a huge help, like for my back, you know, if you have back problems or if you your back strain or whatever, I highly recommend it. It's been a lifesaver for me. And then my drafting table, I've got one of these big, I wish you could see it. I can't like turn my, my <laughs> screen okay. around, but it's one of these old, um, like 1950s with the green, um, yeah. table yeah. surface, you know, it weighs like 600 pounds. It's, it's, <laughs> it's made of steel, you know, it's, it's like ridiculous. And I bought it used because they don't make them anymore. And I've always wanted to have one, uh, because you see all these pictures of the old timers, you know, that have those big drafting tables. And I'm like, Oh, I wish, wish I could get one of those. So I finally found one and it's gr I'm mentioning this because it, it is, uh, it's adjustable, so I can st I actually stand a lot when I'm drawing. I don't sit. I, I sit when I'm inking because I found that I kind of need to. That I need to get that more precision. But I, I do a lot of my penciling now standing at my, my gigantic steel drafting board. And that's also really been good, you know, for my back and, and that sort of thing. So did I answer that? I don't know if I even answered that. but. I, I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> What's the most difficult part of your artistic process? Probably um, the beginning process of, you know, getting a scene established on paper, drawing it, uh, the perspective, getting the, the figure work correct. The last year or two, I've started using these little um, mannequins. They're mm -hmm. little, I, if I have one nearby, it's over there. But it's a little, like a little plastic, like six inch mannequin and so i take i'll pose it and take pictures and then i'll drag that into um, the app and i'll kind of use that i use more references i think now than i used to and and uh so that's that part of the process is kind of tedious just getting things right and and so that's i would say that that's the toughest part and then once all that that heavy lifting is done then it's kind of more fun to, to ink for me, it's, or to collar, you know, to get the collaring and the lettering. For me, those are the easier uh, parts of the, of the process. When did your life change for the better? Oh, wow. What a question. Uh, when did my life change? Well, I mean, I could be really personal and, and say, you know, when my kids were born, you know, uh, when I, when I got married, you know, and the, all those you know, great moments in my life, you know, that I can, that I can speak to for sure. Um, is that, is that what you're kind of yeah. getting at? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are all, those are all definitely big, big, great moments. What do you believe stands between you and complete happiness? You know, uh, I don't look at it that way so much. I mean, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to live my best possible life, I guess, you know, right now. So, I'm not the kind of person that wakes up and, and thinks, what can I do that would make me um, happier or happy? Because I, I feel pretty, pretty good in that, in that area, just that I'm trying to, um, like I said, just kind of live, live my the best possible version of myself is, is kind of what I'm getting at trying to. I think that's all we can do. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, well, we don't though. And a lot of times, you know, we don't, and, and that's just, part of human nature so that's my i guess that's my goal is to is to do those things you've had a lot of i'm sure mentors and, and people in your life over the years what is the wisest thing that someone has ever said to you that stuck with you uh, <clears throat> well uh, i guess in comics i can talk about um you know there's been several people like um when i worked at malibu um one of the i guess the i think he was the art director or he was the I'm not sure what his title was. Jerry Bingham, who, who's a pretty well-known penciler, worked at DC in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think he did some Marvel work. But anyway, he came into to Malibu as kind of a mentor figure for us in the art department, you know, and I was like 22 or 23, you know, and so he was the seasoned, you know, guy in the industry. And, and so he had a lot of really valuable um, advice and things uh, that I think kind of stuck with me over the years. That and just just learning some of the techniques like with penciling and inking from him was, was very valuable. Um, 
uh, things that people said to me, I think, over the people who I really admire, like um, Marv Wolfman, I ran into at a convention once, and, it, and this was when I was kind of just starting out, and um, I remember asking him, I said, you know, does this, does this get any easier, you know, comics, working in comics? And he's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> just give it, he just kind of gave me this like thousand yard stare. It doesn't. And that's that stuck with me. You know, that was like kind of like a cautionary, you know, thing, you know. So it, it kind of grounded me a little bit uh, to the to the to true nature of, of the comics industry and what, what it can be like. Professionally, then, what is one mistake that you'll never ever do again? Oof. What what mistakes? I don't. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. That's kind of a loaded question. Um, uh, I just don't know where to even begin. I mean, uh, I've always tried to like put my best foot forward. You know, with with projects um, and and how I've dealt with with that. And so, um, I mean, mistakes. You know, I, I, still, I don't look back at stuff like that too much. You know, like, oh, I wish I would have turned left when I turned right kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that's a tough, sure, that's a tough sure. question. I don't, you know, it's like, I just don't think about that stuff. Like, oh, I really screwed up this, this job or I really, I wish I hadn't done X, Y, Z, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to, I'd have to really think about that. I, I have obviously made mistakes. Everybody does you know, in, in this business. What could you pay more attention to in your life? Jeez, man, this is like, I feel like I'm on Oprah. <laughs> I just don't have the money. <laughs> I guess the world around me, I'm, I'm kind of a uh, absent-minded professor. You know, I kind of get in my zone and uh, it's hard for me to, to, to really see things clearly sometimes that maybe I should be looking at a little bit more clearer. Um, and that's certainly, I have certainly paid paid for that over the years, a little more aware of, of everything. Cause I, I tend to kind of go into my own little fantasy land. Do that. Is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you'd like to share with those that are watching and listening to this? Interview? The high points of the book I'm working on now, you know, I'm really excited about, um, and, uh, definitely feel free to, to check out my website. I'm, I'm, uh, at beyondforwardcomics.com and, uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram also, and uh, you can even you can buy the print edition of Arc and some of my other uh, creator and stuff over at IndiePlanet.com, which I don't think I I don't think I sent you the link to that. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, professional would probably be I would think like Jack Kirby. I think personally. Um, Jeez, I mean, the problem with that question is that where I grew up, there, there really weren't, there weren't very many artists, you know, like that I could kind of like go to and, and look at and say, wow, you know, teach me, you know, I just, there wasn't a lot of that. There was a, um, there was a guy, a young, a young guy who was working at my high school, whose name was, I think, Larry Blake, and he was a aspiring comic book artist and he did a lot of like um i don't know like small press stuff before i even knew what that meant and he would sit up on the, the stage in the school and draw comics and he had all these like like kiss fanzine comics and stuff that he was doing and i think that was the person the first time i saw a human being drawing comics and I, and it, you know, that was, that was really impressive to me seeing that, oh, okay, you can actually do this. And I thought, you know, I think, I think I could do this too. And so I think that would be, he doesn't know it. And I, I don't know what's, you know, where he is today, but, but uh, yeah, I'd say he was probably actually a pretty big inspiration for, for a kid, you know, who was interested in that stuff. From a professional standpoint, you've created a lot of work in your career from, well, heart to many others that are too numerous to list in this particular question. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I guess, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm at the end of the day, I'm, I'm producing 
the kind of work I want to produce, you know, I'm, I'm creating the kinds of stories that I want to create. Um, you know, the goal of course is, is any creator is you want, you want more eyes on it, you know, and that's always the, that's always the challenge to, to get, to get more people uh, interested. Um, but yeah, on, on a personal level, sure. You know, I definitely, I've, I've, checked off a lot on my list you know i mean i was able to to break into comics very young and i worked with a lot of top talent you know through malibu and then at dark horse and, and marvel and then image and so you know i've done i've been able to do a lot i think looking back if i if i stopped today i guess i could look back on it and say yeah you know i think i did i did okay but but i, I still have um i still have the fire in my belly to keep to keep doing this so um so yeah i guess on 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 one level sure yeah i, I feel like i'm you know successful on, on some levels and maybe on other levels kind of want to get there a little do a little more the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failure uh i just like curl up into a fetal position and and a little bit of like saliva comes out my mouth and i just kind of quiver for a while oh, that was it. <laughs> I, no i mean yeah i mean i've had i definitely have had failures you know in the business you know i've had books that have did not you know achieve the the level of success that that i thought it would or that the publisher thought it would what comes to mind for me would be probably in the late 90s when the industry kind of collapsed and and uh Publishers were going out of business. Marvel went bankrupt. Um, I I couldn't find work anywhere. I was just like totally all the contacts I had at Marvel and Dark Horse and gone. Most of them laid off, or the publishers just didn't. You know, you got like a thousand guys trying to to or all fighting over one book, right? So um, when I was working on the uh, GI Joe miniseries, that was supposed to be this big you know, super successful franchise, you know, that Dark Horse had that property. And so everybody was really excited about it. And it, it went over like, you know, crickets, you know, it didn't sell because that was when the industry itself was really in bad shape. So that was a, that was pretty crushing, you know, cause we all thought that, oh, this was it, you know, this is going to be great. So that was hard, but you just kind of, you know, you just kind of go, go, you learn from, things and you and you try to to not repeat the same mistakes you know or or you just try to be more cognizant of of those risks i mean i could go on and on about that because i mean there was stuff at marvel too that uh you know should have could have but didn't you know things that that took off or things that sold pretty well and then yeah, not so much you know so there's always there's always that that risk got to be difficult as well too because it, the it's the public that is clamoring for comics or they're going to say no this is not what we want type deal but no no one really knows and that's that's yeah and it's hard yeah. it's hard as a creator because you really you're asking a lot of someone to make an investment of their time and money into a property that you don't know they don't know anything about it you know and it's and he, especially if it's not if they if the characters don't wear a cape it, i mean i mean that's just the reality it's just that's a really hard sell because people like recognition they like to they like to they like to see things that they're familiar with and and hollywood is very guilty of this too because they don't they don't take many um creative risks when it comes to uh, properties to, to new ideas. They they want the they want the ideas that are proven. Oh, you know, Spider Man has a built in fan base of what two billion or something. You know, so they don't have any concerns whatsoever that it's not going to you know make a ton of money. But when it's and it's the same with the on a microcosmic scale, the comics industry where it's a big ask. You know, like Hark is a big ask because it's a totally different concept it's a totally unrecognizable hero you know and and but for me i just do it because i want to do it and if you read it and you love it 
that's like icing on the cake for me. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of independent creators over the, over the years. I mean, webcomic creators is how the show got started. So in the early, early two thousands, you know, the, the end of the true independent creators that were just getting into the internet and just bringing up their own, their own IPs, you know, it was, it was great to see a kind of a resurgence during that particular decade, especially with how dark of times that the comic industry had just gone through. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, at least still these days are, are more than willing to not only buy digital comics, but also to put their time and their effort into reading something more so online, I think, because everything is mobile, everything is in the palm of your hand already. So it's, it's great to see that Hark is also digital as well, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, I've been beating that drum for 20 years because I was working in web comics too. And uh, right at the beginning and I was totally enamored by the idea of digital comics and then thought, well, this is just the way it needs to be, you know, and it didn't, you know, now it's kind of happening, you know, and I buy personally, I don't buy, I don't buy any physical comics unless it's something really special that I want to have on my bookshelf. Like a lot of stuff that I buy now is digital just because I, you know, it's, it's easier and it's, and it's, uh, and I think the generation today, I think they have more, um, they, they assign more intrinsic value to digital than say my generation, you know, uh, who still wants that physical, you know, experience of, of reading a comic. And I still like that too, but I think today's generation, especially the one after, they're going to be totally over print. I think it'll be digital is just like, why not digital? And which, is, which I think is great. I think that's really, um, yeah, that's the way to go for sure. I've been, I've been on board that train for a long time. I'm glad everybody else is, you know, doing it, you know, and, and most of my stuff is on comiXology now. Um, you know, the, the Marvel stuff is up there. Um, the image, image stuff, the Dark Horse stuff is not. I don't know if Dark Horse even, are they even on, are they still doing their own thing or their books, they're on Comixology now? You know, that's a good question. I thought they were still doing their own thing, but it's been a while since I've kind of looked into yeah. them. So yeah, something I'll have to look at. <laughs> I love seeing that. I love seeing my stuff on there just for, you know, just to see it up there, it's cool. <laughs> I see my stuff in the in the dollar bin. You know, I go looking because I go to dollar bins and look for stuff, and I'm like, oh, there's Jay's. There's a thing I did. Oh God, that's in there too. <laughs> I just I'll lift it up. Well, that looks pretty cool. You know, stick it back down in there. But I'll put it up in the front. You know. <laughs> lift it up a little bit for somebody. You know. They see it. Yep. <laughs> hey, I know. I don't know how to take that. I still, I'm, I'm kind of have mixed feelings about that. I see the dollar bin stuff. I'm like, I don't know. Is that is that good or bad? What does that mean? You know, I I think if someone buys it, that's that's a person that had never seen your work before. Right. That is in is interested in reading what you created. Yeah. So I think that's that's. It doesn't matter if it's in a dollar bin, if it's in a library, yeah. if you buy it digitally, you know, whatever. If someone's experiencing joy from what you've created, you know, more yeah. power too. Yeah, and I I try to keep it in perspective too. Like going back to your question about success and failure, it's like. At the end of the day, I, here I am in a comic shop, and I'm I'm looking at my something that I worked on, you know, that's in in the comic shop, you know. And it, sure, it's in the it might be in the dollar bin, or maybe it's somewhere else. But that in, in itself is like I do take stock in that. Like that's pretty cool, right? I mean, that's kind of cool that 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 I I was able to accomplish those things, you know. So yeah, that's kind of a part two answer to your Oprah question. <laughs> well, I got I got one last Oprah question for you. So hang on a second. <laughs> it's funny you you brought up the next generation that follows this one that are buying digital comics, but this goes to more of a creative perspective. The younger generation, of course, are looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic artist, writer, or whatever they'd like to be creatively. 
how can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oof. Um, you know, I think it's all kind of cyclical in a way. I think that, uh, you know, kids get started on, get started in comics. You know, they it used to be going to the comic shop or, or well, in my case, it was going to like the, the corner drugstore, you know, or the gas station when they used to have the spinner racks. And then, and then it became the comic shops. And then, and now it's, it's comiXology, you know, or the other digital um, apps. So I think it's just, uh, it's kind of just the, the process is a little different, but I think they're, you know, comics is such a, um, it's such a universal thing and it's so ancient form of communication that it's never going to go away because it's just such a simple way to communicate and humans are always going to look for simple ways to communicate, you know, um, not to say comics are simple, but they're, they are that they are in that format where it's visual it's visual and so i think that the next next generation they'll get turned on to comics maybe you know maybe they'll be like beamed into their brains at that point you know with little microchips but it'll still be you know it'll it'll still be that same you know inspiration i think that that'll make them want to to create their own but I hate to say this, Scott, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. I do greatly appreciate it. And um, you kind of mentioned the social media before, but where can we find, of course, Hark and your other works on? The so I think maybe the easiest way would be to go directly to comicsology.com and just type in Scott Reed and, and you should see everything that's there. And, and in that list, you'll see Hark. Which you know, again, Hark is kind of the underdog right now. It's it's like I said, it's not a it's not a comic with characters running or flying around with capes. You know, it, it is a big ask for for new readers. But I hope if you if you like science fiction, if you like books like Dune, two thousand one, Terminator, all that stuff rolled into one. If that's if that's really kind of interests you, then I think you may really like Hark. Um, so comiXology is probably the, the best, easiest way. You can also go, you can get to it from my site, which is beyondforwardcomics.com. And from there, you can jump over to indieplanet.com. They have the print editions of Hark and also of uh, some of my other stuff. Saga of the Dune Universe is also available in a big, nice, uh, big uh, trade paperback through Indie Planet. Um, so those are really the best two places. I'm also on Twitter. You can find me there um, and uh, Instagram as well. Well, like I said, thank you so much, Scott. I, I greatly appreciate the, the time you took for this. And I can't wait to see. Uh, I want to see the entire series. So I'll be one of the first ones to pick it up. I, comicology for sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thanks. Thanks for, uh, you know, taking the time to do this. This was a lot of fun. Well. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Uh, you know, you can see this interview and thousands of others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. You can also see this interview on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching to Two Geeks Talking. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.